So I am going to talk briefly about my book and then we're going to dive into a discussion. I started writing this book after getting an assignment from the New York Times Magazine. And they assigned me to write about the topic of teacher quality. This was a very buzzy topic at the time and it made sense to give the assignment to me. Um, I have been obsessively learning and reporting about education since I was 17 years old. So uh, starting Starting then and every day till this assignment, I got up every morning, learned everything I could about education, and uh, wrote about it. So you would think, and the New York Times Magazine assumed, that I might know something about teaching. Well, that was a wrong assumption. Um, and I, as I soon learned when I set out to report about really what did make an effective teacher. And so I wrote this book because I realized that there's a great disconnect, not only in my understanding in my early days as a reporter, but also in our national dialogue about how to improve education. And I think a lot of it boils down to a misunderstanding of teaching. So just to quickly walk through some of uh, the revelations that I experienced, we'll do an exercise together. Um, I'm going to assign the room three problems, and we're going to participate in, and give me some answers to these questions. This is literally an experience that I had. So here's the first problem. What is 49 times 5? Who is brave enough to wager a guess? Just say it out loud. Okay, you're all in agreement, and you're right. Good job. 49 times 5 is 245. Here's the next question, problem two. Why would a child think that 49 times 5 is 405? The math teacher educators are not allowed to answer because you will ruin our experiment. I'm just going to encourage you to think about that while I go to the next question. Number three, our final problem, which of the following two individuals is most likely to know why a child would think that 49 times 5 is 405? Um, two options. Option A is Hyman Bass. Uh, he is a professor emeritus of mathematics at Columbia University. Um, his accomplishments include inventing an entire field of algebra. Did you know that algebra has multiple fields inside of it? I did not. <laughs> But he does, and he made one, and that's why he got a Presidential Medal of Honor for his contributions to mathematics. So he's option A. He, why would a child think that 49 times 5 is 405? Is he more likely to know that? Or option B, um, Deborah Ball, whose uh, most uh, celebrated accomplishments include teaching elementary school in East Lansing, Michigan, where she very entrepreneurially located an abandoned stove on a street and dragged it into her classroom so that she could use it for fun learning activities with kids. So. Uh, Again, I can't hear, I can't see you, so let's vote with our applause. Who votes for Hyman Bass? <laughs> this audience will not be fooled. So, in fact, um, it was Deborah Ball, the teach. oh, do you want to vote? Was, do you think it was Deborah Ball? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're right. Um, and Deborah Ball actually is the person who walked me through an exercise very similar to this one, which really opened up my eyes. What I came to see is that teaching requires a specialized body of knowledge and skill, something very different from simply knowing a subject well, something that even someone as brilliant as Hyman Bass uh, cannot make up when he's encountered with a problem. And yet, that teachers don't just encounter this one mistake that they have to diagnose the underlying error of. They also, that's just one student's mistake in a class of 30 students. And that's just one subject among, say, four or five or six that an elementary school teacher is teaching. So 
teaching requires a tremendous amount of specialized knowledge and skill. And just quickly, because it will be relevant later, um, I'm going to give you the answer to problem number two. Uh, so why would a child think that 49 times 5 is 405? This is the correct method that uh, using the standard algorithm for calculating the answer that you all correctly said is 245. It involves uh, 5 times 9 is 45, carry the 4. First, multiply 5 and 4 to get 20, and then add the 4. So maybe you can start to imagine what a child might have done wrong. The child instead of first multiplying and then adding, added the four to the four to get eight, and then multiplied by five to get 40. So that's the kind of com complicated calculation that a teacher needs to be able to make in an instant. So this is one of the major takeaways for me. Teaching requires specialized knowledge and skill, not what I assumed. And here's the second major takeaway. We have not treated teaching that way in this country. And in many places, we still don't. So here's a few examples. Um, since we're at a school of education, I thought I would give you some of the bad history of education schools, of which we'll hear later. There are some exceptions. Uh, but the, when universities took over the business of teacher education, here is the man who published the first ever article and the first ever journal of education research. His name is Josiah Royce at Harvard. And this is what he wrote in that article. He wrote, there is no such thing as a science of pedagogy. No such thing. This was in the first ever published journal. I wonder what they thought they were going to write about. <laughs> what did they think teaching did require in the early days of the institutions whose whole job was purportedly to prepare teachers? They thought, as this colleague of Josiah Royce's at Harvard said, that teaching requires only common sense. So they thought the exact opposite of what it turns out teaching requires. Um, another example, this is the man who, uh, sorry, I gave it away, who uh, is the known as the founding father of the uh, crown jewel discipline of most university education schools educational psychology. And yet when he was recruited to do this job, it was against his will. And that's a story that repeated itself. He wanted to study psychology, but there were no, not enough jobs in psychology. So he had to study the psychology of education. Um, what did he do? Like his fellow colleagues, he decided teaching required only common sense. There was no science of teaching. So instead, he would just continue studying psychology, but call it educational psychology. And as a result, when he encountered, so what's the consequence of this attitude inside universities? When Professor Thorndike encountered a group of practitioners, um, he was recorded to have had the following exchange with them. One of the practitioners was having a problem of pra in their school. A student wasn't understanding something. The teacher needed to change her practice. And they said, Professor Thorndike, what should I do? What would you do in this situation? And Professor Thorndike said, do? Why, I'd resign. He had so little interest in teaching that he didn't even have an answer for the practical question. So here's one more example of uh, what, it, what it looks like. And this is I'm taking from our other sponsor here, Teach for America, um, of what it looks like that we as a country do, have not taken um, teaching seriously. Stephen Farr, who works with Teach for America, told me a story that many people, to educators told me um, similar stories about the, in, his induction into the teaching profession. So we've talked about the problems in before teachers come to school, what about once they get there? Uh, they've been prefer, prepared, you arrive at school, and Stephen Farr, like many teachers, was assigned 
a mentor who is supposed to induct him into the profession. And the mentor uh, told him, well, I legally need to observe you teaching, but I have to tell you I would really rather not. She said, teaching is the second most private act, and I would much rather not watch somebody else do it. So another word for this, um, slightly less salacious, is the idea of the egg crate school model. So in schools, teachers start isolated, as Stephen Farr did, and they continue to be isolated every day of their teaching existence in the common practice. They are treated as if they, it's as if they were to touch, they would break, like an egg, the egg crate school model. So those were my first two main aha moments that led to the reporting of this book. First, teaching requires specialized knowledge and skill. And second, we have not treated teaching that way in this country. But here is my third and final conclusion from my reporting. It is completely within our power to change this. And I'm just going to quickly run through a few reasons to be optimistic. One is to do with kids. So uh, there's, we can all reel off all of the statistics that tell us how low academic performance is in our country. And one takeaway would be perhaps that's what is possible for most kids. Well, here's uh, some other stories. Um, researchers have studied children like these two, uh, who are street children in Recife, Brazil, where these children supplement their families' incomes by selling fruits and nuts on the streets of Brazil. And in the course of doing this, researchers who have studied this, these children have noticed that in order to make their calculations to sell their goods, these children make incredibly complex calculations in their heads with almost 100% accuracy. So for example, one little boy was observed by researchers selling coconuts. The customer wanted four coconuts. The boy knew the price was 35 cruceros per coconut, and so he calculated out loud accurately the final price. 140 cruceros. But then the researcher did something that was part of a study that that researcher was doing. The researchers would take the children who had just solved these problems in their head as a result of their uh, selling and ask them the same problem, but this time on paper in the language of school. And they would do that five minutes after, you know, no more than five minutes after the student had just solved this problem out loud. So this little boy was pulled aside and asked, what is 35 times four on paper? And you can see the answer that he got. 200, remember the correct answer is 140. How, uh, I have two questions, two, two takeaways from this that I think are important. Um, first, the problem is not with the kids. So he gets the problem wrong when it's on paper in the language of school and the researchers find this happens over and over again. The kids will get the problem right in the language of the street when they're doing it in their heads. They can do the math but when they're given the same problem on paper, they get it wrong. So the problem is not the kids. The problem has something to do with school. And here's the second thing, and the, I do think this is a reason to be optimistic as well. Can anyone see what error this boy made? It's the same error that Deborah Ball in Michigan told me about and introduced me to. And when I saw this in the journal article that it was written in, I thought this confirms something really important that is another finding of the research. And that is that kids repeat the same mistakes over and over again. I said before how complicated it is to teach, and it does require specialized knowledge and skill, but the reality is that there's not an infinite number of mistakes that kids will make. There is actually a pretty discreet number, and we have it in our power to predict those mistakes. A boy in Brazil will make the same mistake as a boy in Michigan. So 
the problem is not the kids. And also, teaching can, we can uh, predict the errors that teachers will have to predict. And so we can prepare teachers to anticipate those errors. One more reason to be optimistic. Um, this story starts with a bit of pessimism, I apologize, but I promise it gets better. Um, this woman, some of you might recognize, is Magdalene Lampert. Uh, and she told me a story that I think encapsulates some of the reasons to be optimistic. She spent mo the early part of her career teaching uh, students and then dedicating herself to trying to help other teachers give access to the same learning opportunities she gave her kids access to. But Midway through her career, after many efforts, she began to feel disenchanted and, frankly, pessimistic about the prospects for change in this country. She thought that given the constraints in higher education, she was a professor at the university level, given the constraints at the K-12 level in this country, maybe it was just impossible for great teaching to exist at scale. Maybe we were destined as a country to have only pockets of excellence because maybe that's the only thing that was possible. So she did what all disenchanted professors do. Uh, she took a sabbatical <laughs> and she went to Rome where her plan was to drink a lot of wine and learn Italian. And it was in her Italian class that she saw something very important. She was she had signed up for this class on the internet to learn Italian, and she's sitting there in class in a lesson when something noteworthy happens. Fifteen minutes into the lesson, the teacher stops, leaves the room, and comes back with a new activity for, the, for his students to do. This might not have been noteworthy to me, because I'm not a great teacher, but Magdalene Lampert is a great teacher, and she knew another great teacher when she saw one, and she knew what this teacher was doing. He had carefully studied the work of her and her fellow students, and noticed that they were all struggling with the same problem. They all were not understanding subject-verb agreement. But the task he had assigned them was a different task targeting a different problem. So he had left the room, come back, and give them a task that was more appropriate to what they needed to learn in that moment. This was masterful teaching. He had diagnosed the underlying misunderstanding and immediately addressed it. And what was more impressive to Magdalene is that the next time, in three weeks, when the teacher switched, so the way this school worked, every three to four weeks you would get a new teacher, in three to four weeks when she got a new teacher, it was the same, another great teacher. And the next time, it was the same, and the same, and the same. Every teacher at this school was excellent. She ultimately came to turn this into a research project um, and conclude that what was going on at Italia Idea was something she called infrastructure. So, what is infrastructure? In transportation, infrastructure is all the invisible things that make it possible for me to have been in Denver, Colorado last week, New York City today, and Philadelphia tomorrow. What is that? It's speed limits, FAA regulations, bridges, the Uber app, right? All of these things make it possible, but we don't often think about them. Well, similarly, in at education, at Italia Idea, there was an invisible infrastructure making excellent teaching and learning possible at scale. So what were some of the features of this infrastructure? One, material and technical resources. The, teachers at a t the teacher could leave 15 minutes of the way through the lesson, come back a minute later with a new activity because there was a lesson bank at Italia Idea where all the teachers collectively created uh, lessons that they could share that addressed the things that they knew their students would struggle with. What else? 
induction, teacher education, and professional development were also important. So she, Magdalene Lampert learned that Italia Idea actually had an entire institution that existed for the sole purpose of training teachers to teach at Italia Idea. And at that institution, this might not sound surprising to some in this room, at that institution, the purpose was to help people learn to teach. When a person asked the problem of practice, the professor would not say, I just resigned. The professor had concrete experiences to offer and also created rehearsals where students could practice the routines like how to study students' work in order to identify an underlying misunderstanding. One more thing at work, the organization of work. So at Italia Idea, why did they have a lesson bank? It was not something that the teachers created in their spare time. It was part of their job description. And they had the time built into their job to learn about teaching and create materials to help them teach. This was not something they did outside the job. Um, we all know in this room that that's not true in this country. Uh, the average number of hours that American teachers spend in front of students teaching are, is a thousand per year. In countries that outperform us, it's less than, ha it's almost half of that. It's less than 600 hours a year. That leaves them more than 400 hours in which they can learn about teaching. Learn things like how to identify when students are struggling with subject verb agreement, or why would a child think 49 times five is 405. Um, how am I doing on time, Joe? Good. No, stop. I have one more reason to be optimistic, but I'll either share it later or now. Uh, no, share, it now. share it now. Okay. Here is my one more reason to be optimistic. And that is that we do have a history in this country of building the kind of infrastructure that we are, that many of you in this room are working on building now. So a few examples of that history. Um, normal schools are institutions that existed before teacher education shifted to the university and that inform institutions like uh, Bank Street and I think Teach for America's work today. Um, what are normal schools? Well, at normal schools there are two groups of learners simultaneously. One is the students being taught by the teacher and the second circled by yellow is the future teachers who are also being taught by that master teacher about how to teach. So teaching is here the centerpiece of the work. We also have a history of people who in this country, professors of education, have believed that teaching is a science. One of my favorites is Colonel Francis Parker who said teaching is not only a science but is the science of all sciences. He also said somewhere else that it is the art of all arts, interestingly. And we have, of course, John Dewey, who said that we should create a whole science of education that can study what gifted teachers do intuitively and scale that learning for others. So, we do have a history of creating this infrastructure. The people on this panel are doing it today. And I think that we need to change the conversation so that when education reporters come into the field, when voters read about education, they do not read a political story that treats teaching like a natural born skill or education like something we can hold accountable until it gets better. Um, we need to have a new narrative about what will take to improve education. And I'm excited to have that conversation now. Thank you. <laughs>